Hello, I'm Lorraine Williams, and welcome to this edition of In the Classroom. Today's topic, grudges, no matter how well intended when in discussion, grudges just suggest bad news, unless given up to God. Let's pray. Lord, may your infallible word open hearts to receive your life-changing love and enduring grace. This, Lord, is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Saints, Leviticus 19.18 says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Do not seek revenge. In other words, do not look for an opportunity or plan a time to do harm. That's a sin. Do not bear a grudge. In other words, do not hold wickedness in your heart. Whether you act on the evil thought or not, that is a sin. Do not God's commands are based solely on his righteousness for our holiness and has absolutely nothing to do with our human reasoning or circumstances. God knows that our reasoning coupled with our feelings can allow a grudge to harden our hearts and lead us down a dangerous path. Sometimes, a path of no return. A grudge goes way beyond unforgiveness, saints. I've heard it said too many times, unfortunately. I can't forgive so-and-so, but I wish them well. Of course, we are commanded to forgive, but to not forgive, but still wish your offender well is at least a step in the right direction. The heart is still pliable. The heart can still be turned in the right direction. A grudge cannot extend well wishes. A grudge harbors deep, unrelenting ill will and hatefulness. And when left unchecked, as we will see, from a couple of folks we are about to discuss, will take you down that dangerous path of no return. Herodias. Had a huge grudge against John the Baptist. Proverbs 21, 24 says, the proud and arrogant person, mocker is his name, behaves with insolent fury. That, my dear saints, would describe Herodias quite accurately. A proud and arrogant woman with power and position. To challenge anything Herodias did, whether it was right or whether it was wrong, was not in your best interest. She was furious with John the Baptist for daring to question the legitimacy of her marriage to Herod. You all have to read the story, Mark 6, 16 through 28. For his boldness and honesty in upholding the sanctity of marriage, John the Baptist is thrown into prison to languish there for at least a year. No threat, silenced, and forgotten, except by Herodias. And when the opportunity, the opportunity presented itself, Herodias wastes no time avenging her offender. Using her daughter's influence over Harriet, Herodias has John the Baptist beheaded. Now, a couple of things about the dangers of holding a grudge. Number one, you dirty other people's hands. When Herodias instructs her daughter to request Harriet give her the head of John the Baptist, the daughter does not shrink back from this grisly request, but also she audaciously requests that John's head be immediately brought to her and on a platter. 
and she proudly presents it to her mother. I looked at several different Bible versions. Y'all, I wanted to badly find at least one version that might in some way suggest that Herodias' daughter was repulsed or at least taken aback by her mother's request. I found nothing. All Bible versions basically state the same thing. Her daughter, she hastened, she hurried, she went straightway to Herod and made her request known. Herodias' grudge became her daughter's grudge. Mama's cold, hateful heart became her daughter's cold, hateful heart. Mama's arrogance became daughter's arrogance. She was a chip off the old block. Hmm. But be careful. I've heard it said, what you do in moderation, your children will do in excess. Number two, the dangers of holding a grudge. You cannot handle a grudge. We cannot handle a grudge. God says in Leviticus 19, 17, do not bear a grudge against others, but settle your differences with them so that you will not commit a sin because of them. I've committed a sin because someone else sinned. That don't even sound right. They sinned against me, so now I'm going to sin against them. It makes no sense. So now I'm in no better standing before God than the person who wronged me. Now we're both in the same boat. So you see, the only reason a grudge can destroy the person you hate is because it has already destroyed you. Herodias' grudge led her to commit a sin of double jeopardy. She took two lives, John the Baptist's life and her daughter's life. She turned her daughter into a better and bigger sinner than she was. Satan got a two-for-one deal. He got a mother-daughter deal. He sifted Herodias like wheat, and Herodias took her daughter through the sifter with her. Saints, beware. Although it was easy for a grudge to attach itself to a prideful and arrogant woman like Herodias, it can turn a loving person, a compassionate person, a kind-hearted person bad also. That's exactly what happened to Absalom. A loving brother who allowed his tender compassion for his sister's suffering to turn into a grudge. Absalom birthed the grudge. He nurtured the grudge. And when full grown, he could not control what he gave life to. Absalom's grudge drove him to death. He had his brother, Amnon, murdered two years after Amnon had raped their sister. And how could Absalom possibly think that murdering his brother would endear him to their father, King David? Saints, grudges are unreasonable. Look at this. Five years after. After the murder of Amnon, which is a total of seven years since the rape of his sister, Absalom grudge now turns its focus onto King David. Then for another four years, patiently and methodically, Absalom conspires to kill King David and overthrow King David's kingdom. Now, I'm giving you these numbers to emphasize that grudges don't die. Grudges get stronger with time. Grudges, when they take root in your heart, they are very difficult, if not impossible, to get rid of. 
That's why God says, do not bear a grudge. Let it go. And he says, let it go with love. Love your brother. Do not grudge. And love is what he says. Look at this. 11 years since Amnon had raped their sister and nine years since Amnon's murder until the grudge finally reaches his peak. What does the destroyer do when he's finished using us for chaos, deception, and misery? He strikes the final blow. Absalom becomes entangled, literally, in his own plot and conspiracy, and he is killed. The only reason Absalom could cause so much misery and deception and confusion and, and heartache is that the grudge he birthed, the grudge he nurtured, nurtured when full grown sifted him like wheat. Y'all have to read the story. It's in 2 Samuel 13, 12 through 18, 15. Grudges are never appeased. Wasn't it enough? that John the Baptist was in prison and may never be free? Was it enough? Wasn't it enough that he was beheaded? Not for Herodias' daughter, it wasn't. Having his head placed on a platter and presented to her mother now firmly established her power, her arrogance, her swiftness for cruelty in her own right. And let's be very clear about it she would be more dangerous than her mama. We will be right back after this short message. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. He enables me to go on the heights. With all the things going on in our lives and in this world today, we tend to lose our strength, which slows us down. But because of God's great love, He gives us the strength to overcome. He will give us the speed of a deer and bring us safely over the mountain. Although that climb to the top can be challenging, God is there to provide us with the tools we need to get us to the top. The closer our relationship is with Him, the more speed we have in our feet to overcome. We must keep the faith, stay in the Word, trust, pray, and depend on God for guidance. Welcome back. We left off with grudges never being appeased. We see that with Herodias' daughter. And now if we look over at Absalom, Absalom pulled a cruel power play himself. Wasn't it enough that King David's son, Amnon, had been murdered to avenge the rape of his daughter? That should have settled it right there. That should have appeased the, the, the grudge. No. Wasn't it enough that he had to flee? David, King David had to flee his kingdom and he was made to wander with no place to lay his head? No, that wasn't enough for Absalom. Grudges can never inflict enough pain. In broad daylight, a tent was pitched on the rooftop of the palace where Absalom proceeded to sleep with King David's concubines that David had left behind while on the run from Absalom. This was a major display of power and victory on Absalom's part, sending an explicit message to the world that he was in power, and if King David was not dead, he was as good as dead, and any thread of hope, of reconciliation between father and son was servant forever. Absalom's grudge would not be appeased. Death was his only recourse. 
I know you might think that these are extreme examples of grudges, and they are, but do not be fooled because grudges at any extent are extreme. At best, they're ungodly. You can still turn it around though, but at worst, they're deadly. You can't turn that around. But that is not how our story has to end. In Jesus, there is victory over grudges. Esau. So begrudged his, his twin brother Jacob that he swore in rage that he would kill him. Consequently, Jacob had to flee his homeland. And here's the thing. With the help of his mother, Jacob did do a deceitful thing to Esau. He did. Their mother goes so far as to tell Jacob in Genesis 27:42b, your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Saints, I don't know about you, but that's a grudge. When you console yourself, comfort yourself, calm yourself down with the thought of killing someone, especially your brother, especially your twin brother, that's a grudge. Read the story, saints. Genesis 27, 1 through 47. Esau was done wrong, y'all. Yet, he and Jacob, when they reunite after at least 14 years, Esau's grudge is gone and replaced with love. Leviticus 19, 18, paraphrasing it, do not bear a grudge but love. Esau's grudge is gone and replaced with love. I said again, Leviticus 19, 18, do not bear a grudge, but love. Esau's grudge is gone and replaced with love. God rewarded Esau for his obedience to his command. The biggest and best reward is when Esau and Jacob meet. Esau runs to Jacob. They embrace and they weep in each other's arms. Also, Jacob gives Esau a portion of his riches, which Esau turns down because he doesn't need it. God has blessed him with more than enough. But Jacob insists that Esau take the wealth of gifts that he's giving him. And here's the thing, saints. Before Jacob returned, God had already started pouring out a blessing to Esau more than he could receive. Then Jacob returns and God pours out even more of a blessing through Jacob, more than Esau could receive. That now is pressed down and overflowing saints. Proverbs 20, 22. Do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong, which that's what Esau did. I'm going to kill you. Then he says, wait for the Lord and he will avenge you. So at some point, Esau realized, and with the help of God, he realized that I got to wait. I got to calm myself down. I got to back up off of this and I got to wait on the Lord and he will. And I don't, maybe it took that full 15 years for Esau to finally wait on the Lord. But he, at some point, he waited on the Lord. It does the, the story with Esau and Jacob, it doesn't tell Esau's side for the 14 years how he got to that point where he could lay that grudge down. But we know that he got there. Um, it tells the story of Jacob, of the offender. And it tells that Jacob, uh, in his plight, because of his deceitfulness, it, it tells now the hardships and the things he had to go through. So it shows what happened to the offender and tells the story of the offender and how now he comes around to himself. And then when he goes back home, all of what he has for Esau, the offended, 
God will work things out. Wait for the Lord and he will avenge you. God will fight your battles. God has commands that he expects us to obey saints and he has promises that he can that we can expect him to keep god has commands that he expects us to obey and he has promises that we can expect him to keep and he promises that i will avenge your offenders he will fight our battles peace has to be still and we have to wait he says wait wait on the lord psalms i'm gonna end with this psalms 39 1 but you need to really read all of psalms 39 it, 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 it's great psalms 39 1 says i say it i will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin i will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. Saints, we have to learn to keep our peace, guard our tongue, and guard our actions. I said I will watch my ways. That means your actions that we have to guard, keep guard over ourselves, that we have to keep guard over our mouth and our actions. Do not be provoked by wickedness. When wickedness comes, we have to be still right then and there. And you keep reading 39. He says, I burned inside because I wanted to speak so bad. I burned inside. But we cannot be provoked by wickedness, for to do so is in sin. And it goes on to say that finally when I spoke, that he cried out to the Lord, that, oof, Lord, we have to cry out to God. And we have to send that anguish and that agony and that, that bitterness and that grudge and all. We got to cry out to God. And, and you know what? It just God dropped something in my spirit. I suppose that's what Esau had to do. That it was burning inside that he had some stuff he wanted to say probably to Jacob before he killed Jacob. But instead, it was burning. And when he let it out, he said, Lord, have mercy. Lord, you have to take this away and you have to replace this with love because only love can replace what I am feeling right now. Only love can replace the hate that I, and the malice and the contempt that I am feeling for my brother right now. And we got to cry out to God that God, when that, that anguish in us, when it bubbles up, you Read Psalms 39 and read it well because it gets to a point where it says that God will avenge the one who has sinned against you. I am paraphrasing it right now, but you read it and you will get there. Ah, saints of God, I pray your strength in the Lord, saints. Mm, thanks for watching this edition of In the Classroom. You can view this episode and others on our YouTube channel. Until next time, be blessed.